So for those who have just come in, just a, a quick Menti question to get your brains thinking. Um, thinking back on, on all the stuff we've learned so far about orbits, what you know, about orbit elements, about orbit periods, velocities, all those kind of things. Um, there's no right answer to this question. I just want to get you thinking, get you chatting to the people around you and, and put in some ideas. So I'll just give you another two minutes while we wait for, for the last people to come in. And some really great answers so far, so. Yeah, some really good answers coming in here, I have to say. So um, the UK is not an easy one, actually. I partly picked it because we're here, obviously. Um, but also the UK is quite a tricky place in terms of trying to view it from, from orbit. It's not always obvious what the best solution will be. Um, and I can see some of you have pointed out some of the difficulties. We're going to go through so, a lot of these, well, all these orbits now anyway. That's kind of today's class. Um, but I can see some of you have sort of chucked in some kind of caveats in your answers, um, so which is really interesting. So again, we'll go through these, but uh, somebody's, a lot of people have suggested a geostationary orbit or a geosynchronous orbit, so we'll talk about that, but the idea with that is that it would stay overhead uh, all the time, but somebody has pointed out you'd need a very powerful camera because it's very far away from the Earth, right? So you get constant viewing, but you're very far away, so depending on what you're doing, might not be ideal. Uh, a couple of people have said polar orbits because the UK is actually quite far north, relatively speaking. It's also cloudy, so you'd get more frequent uh, overpasses with a polar orbit maybe. Um, but again, that's not necessarily ideal because you won't get that continuous coverage. Um, somebody said uh, an elliptical orbit with the apogee over the UK. We'll talk a little bit about those as well and why that might be a good idea. Um, we talked about obviously we would move slower at the apogee, so that's the idea from that, that we would be slow as we passed over the UK. Um, so there's some really good ideas coming in here and some people talking about maybe inclining the orbit at 40 degrees um, and we'll talk about why that might be a good idea as well. So thank you all for throwing in your answers, uh, much appreciated. And with that, we will kick off the class in earnest. So um, this is just a, again, this is slightly out of date. I think I picked up this image in like March or something like that. Um, but essentially, it is an image showing all of the satellites that we are currently tracking in orbit around our Earth. These are just active satellites, so there's other debris as well. Um, and so you can see there's kind of some really distinct features when we look at all these different satellites. So we've got a cluster down really, really close to the Earth. This is our low Earth orbit. And again, we'll go through these in detail. You've got this kind of haze of, of satellites out here. These cover our medium and also our highly elliptical orbits. But there's not that many, and you can see they're fairly well distributed. And then you've got this ring around the outside. Can anyone tell me what that ring is? Yes. Anyone else? <laughs> anyone? Yeah? No, geostationary. geostationary. So this is the ring that lots of you were proposing, right? So this is the geostationary ring. So you can see how far away it is compared to our low Earth orbit. Um, so yeah, so this is our geo ring, which is again very, very popular. Uh, this is, I thought I was going to get some things up, does that come back? Or maybe it'll come back later. Uh, just, I don't know if you can see it here, I might have a slide later where it looks into it a bit more detail. Some interesting features here, I don't know if you can make it out, but there's a little almost ring of dense satellites around this sort of band, um, which is about, I reckon, about 50 degrees latitude. 
And I don't know for certain why there's that kind of ring happening there, but my theory is that uh, Starlink, which we talked about on Monday, um, this constellation of thousands of satellites that SpaceX are launching, a bunch of their satellites are inclined at 50 degrees-ish inclination. Um, and we'll talk about why that might be, mean there's a cluster here, but I think that's what's causing this little ring here. This stripe here, if you can see it, is like a string of satellites. That is a recently launched bunch of Starlink satellites, because when they launch them, they launch them all together and then they spread them out later. So when you see these streaks um, in a line, that's a Starlink launch, and they're sort of on the order of hundreds of satellites that they then spread out later. This is what it might look like if you stood outside the University of Manchester and you could see everything passing across the sky. So again, these are all satellites. Um, some interesting features, I'll just uh, pause it so we can talk a little bit about what we're seeing, um, although that might make it harder actually. Okay, well, we'll just have to rewind. So a um, couple of things you can see. So the ones that are moving slowly in the distance are further away, obviously, right? So those are the ones that we're seeing moving far away in the distance. Um, and these guys here, which are passing low over the horizon, those are the ones that are going to be inclined at about 50 degrees-ish latitude, because that's where the UK is, so they're only just appearing above the horizon. Whereas these ones, which are kind of going, uh, let's start again, these ones which are kind of passing right up across the field of view, those are ones that are in around polar orbits, right, because they're going straight over the top of the Earth. Um, so this is sped up, obviously. <laughs> Um, but this gives you an idea of all of the things that are flying around. I think this is an hour um, if you were to stand outside uh, the University of Manchester and look up. This is what you would see. Uh, okay. All right. So we've talked a little bit about uh, what we were seeing in that picture about these different orbit regimes. This is just another way of picturing it. So down here at the low end, we've got that LEO region, this low Earth orbit, right? It's exactly what it says on the tin. It is satellites that have a low altitude. They are close to the Earth. And LEO, we generally say, runs up to about 2,000 kilometers altitude. And then we've got this huge chunk in the middle, which was that cloud that we saw, which wasn't very densely populated. That's our sort of medium Earth orbit. Um, and we'll talk about that in a little while, but it's only useful for really very specific cases, which is why it's not tremendously populated. And then up here, then we've got our geo or our uh, geostationary or our geosynchronous orbits, which have a very specific altitude, which is why we get them in that thick band around that uh, orbit. I've put this in here, which is very low Earth orbit, um, which we say is up to about 450 or 500 kilometers. The reason I put that in is that the University of Manchester has a particular expertise in very low Earth orbit, so you might come across it in some of the stuff that you hear from other lecturers throughout the course. Um, but yeah, that's basically where the atmosphere is really dense, um, so we have to really think about how we design our satellites to operate in that regime. Okay. Ah, there's the picture I was looking for. <laughs> I've just got out of sync. So looking back at what we saw before, this is exactly what I said. Um, and that's that band around that I was talking about, where I think that's the Starlinks inclined at about 50 degrees. And there is a line of them all after being deployed. Right. So the next thing that we're going to do is I'm going to get you to think about this. So again, thinking about all of the stuff that we've learned, what would be the advantages to operating in a low Earth orbit and what would be the disadvantages? So again, there's a menti question for this for you to pop your answers in. If you could just put an A before the ones that you think are advantages and a D before the things that you think are disadvantages, um, that would be really helpful so I can see that you know what you're talking about. So I'll just give you a couple of minutes to do that. And again, chat away, discuss. And of course, any questions at this stage about what we've, I mean, that was barely, basically just a picture of space, but um, if anyone has any questions. How's everyone doing this morning? You seem a bit subdued. <laughs> 
Yeah. Oh, sorry, I said you seem a bit subdued, as in everybody seems a bit quiet this morning. <laughs> okay, the answers are coming in now. Good, I've scared you all. Excellent. All right, what have we got here? So I think you've pretty much covered most of the things that I would um, suggest. So the main uh, disadvantage that you've all come up with um, is the fact that there's drag in low Earth orbit, right? So there's atmospheric drag, and that's absolutely the main, the main thing that we have to contend with in low Earth orbit. Um, in the higher altitudes of low Earth orbit, we have less drag to deal with, so you know there's a balance there, um, but that is one of the key considerations for operating in low Earth orbit. Uh, a lot of the advantages that you've talked about, there's some really interesting ones, actually, that I'm quite surprised at, um, but... Cheaper launch, a lot of people have said. Um, you can get good image quality because you're closer to the Earth, uh, which is absolutely true. If you think about taking a picture with a camera, the closer you are to it, the clearer your image is going to be. Um, some more disadvantages here about uh, a lack of coverage, which again is true if you think about it with a camera. If you take a picture from far away, you can see a much bigger area. If you're up close, you can only see a small area. So if we're in low Earth orbit, we can only see that small area, absolutely. Um, fast communication, yes, so if you're closer to the Earth, your communication signals are going to take less time, basically, to get back to Earth. It doesn't sound like, I mean, things are traveling at the speed of light, you wouldn't think it makes a big difference, but when you're out at something like Geo, where you're 36,000 kilometers away, that delay actually is quite significant. Um, so, yeah, some really, really good answers here, and I think what I'll do is I'll capture these and I'll put them up on the, on the blackboard, um, because there's some really, really good ones. But yeah, these are the ones that I've summarized here. So good imaging resolution. So like I say, if you've got a camera and you get up close to someone, then you can make out their nose hairs. If you're far away, you can't, right? So same principle applies to satellites. Uh, low launch energy required, so you don't need as much launch fuel, essentially, to get your satellite up to those lower altitudes. And essentially, that means it's cheaper. Um, and low comms or active payload power. So exactly that. So if we've got a communication system, and you'll look at this in one of the later weeks anyway, you'll need less power to send that signal down to the Earth, right? So you can have a less powerful communication system. And we talked on Monday about active payloads, the idea of using radar, for example, where we have to actually send a signal down to the Earth to be bounced back. Um, and again, if you're closer to the Earth, you need less power for that signal to get all the way to the Earth and back again. Disadvantages, high atmospheric drag disturbance, and that's something that you'll need to account for when you're designing things like your attitude control system, which again, you'll look at in a later week. Um, smaller field of view for the optics. So again, as many of you said, you won't get as much coverage. So if you think about um, if you were using uh, a set of, you know, if you were looking at something from far away, you can see a much bigger field of view. The closer you get to it, the less of it you can see, right? You've kind of zoomed in. So if you think about if you're using a camera and you zoom in, then you can see a smaller portion of that picture, right? So it's the same thing. And that means if you want to see the whole Earth, for example, it's going to take you a lot longer to be able to do that because you're only able to take small pictures at a time. And short passes overhead. So we've got a shorter orbit period. A small, we're moving faster, essentially. So if we want to communicate with our satellite as it passes across the sky, we might only have a five, ten minute window where it's in view of our ground station. Um, whereas if we're looking at something that's further away, it's going to move much more slowly across the sky, and that means we've got much longer to send those signals up and download our data as well. Okay, I think you covered pretty much all of those, and I wouldn't be surprised if there's more in there um, that I've missed. So like I say, I will gather these all afterwards. Any questions on that? A quick note that in spite of these disadvantages, the low Earth orbit is where most of our satellites are, the vast majority of them. Partly because it's cheaper and easier to get to, partly because a lot of these advantages outweigh the disadvantages, and partly because, like I say, things like Starlink um, and OneWeb, these mega constellations are all going into these orbits, and that's starting to bulk them up. Um, but in general, it's been a pretty busy orbit regardless. Yes? Yeah, absolutely. So I've captured a couple of advantages and disadvantages here. You'll see some things 
aren't reflected on everything because, you know, so as we talk about some of the ones that are affected significantly by radiation, you'll see that's mentioned as a disadvantage. But absolutely, at these low Earth orbits, you're avoiding the Van Allen belts, for example, so you won't have a particularly high radiation uh, impact. But I think in the space environment class, you would have talked about the South Atlantic anomaly, which is this patch um, sort of above the South Atlantic, where you do get a high density of radiation, and that can still affect low Earth orbiting satellites. But it is less extreme than it is for other orbits. Well spotted. OK, let's pop on to the next one. Oh, no, we're not popping on to the next one. We're doing ground tracks first, because I thought this was a more sensible way around to do it. So um, this is basically, so we're going to do this for each of the orbits. And what I want you to do is basically think about what the ground track of the satellite is going to be when it's in each of these orbits. So the ground track of the satellite is essentially if you had your satellite in orbit around the Earth and you drew a straight line from the satellite to the center of the Earth, what point would it impact on the surface of the Earth, right? And you could draw that out a bit like there was a pencil, right, coming down from your satellite directly underneath it and drawing out a line as it moved around the Earth. And the reason that's important is it tells us what we can see. So most of the satellites that we launch are orbiting our Earth, and the reason we launch them is because we want them to observe something on the Earth or communicate with something on the Earth. So we need to know what it can see. And so that's why the ground tracks are really important. So this is an example of a low Earth orbiting ground track. It is a prograde orbit, so the satellite is moving in the same direction as the Earth rotates. And so what you end up is something that looks like this. So the green is where the satellite is starting its orbit in this scenario. It's traveling in this direction, following the line of the arrow, um, moving around here, popping off the edge of the map, back on over here, back around, off the edge, back around, and ending at this red point here. Yes? So prograde can be seen as moving eastwards. Correct. Retrograde, westwards. Correct. OK, um, so what you'll notice is that every time our satellite passes the equator, it has shifted a little bit to the west. OK, so every time it comes back around, it doesn't pass over the same point on the Earth. It passes over a point a little bit to the west. The reason this happens is that although our satellite is just going around in a circle, the Earth is rotating underneath it. And so by the time the satellite comes back around, the Earth has rotated such that a different point is now under the satellite as it passes over the equator. And this is really helpful for us if we want to do something like see the entirety of the Earth over a period of time because it means we can build up coverage of different targets. Otherwise, we would continuously pass over the same points on the Earth and we'd never be able to see it anywhere else. So, well, yeah, this is a little animation um, basically to show you what I'm meaning. It's not tremendously exciting, but hopefully that helps to make sense as to what's going on. Right, so the satellite goes around, it does one orbit, so that's one orbit period. It's done around, back to the equator, and you get this change in longitude here. Okay? So, a couple of things that are handy to know that we can actually learn looking at our ground track. The first is we can actually work out what our orbit period is just by looking at this difference in longitude that we get between successive passes. So this omega e is the rotation rate of the Earth, and this delta l is the change in longitude in successive periods. And so if we divide one by the other, we get our orbit period, right? Just because that's how far we've rotated around in that given time. The second reason why that's useful is if we know our orbit period, we already know an equation for orbit period and semi-major axis and how they're related, so we can rearrange that and we can work out the altitude of our satellite just based off this change in longitude that we see in the ground track. So even just looking at the ground track, we can work backwards to figure out what kind of orbit that satellite is in. Or conversely, if you're trying to design an orbit and you know what you want that change in longitude to be, you can use that to define what altitude your satellite needs to be at. Uh, this is for circular orbits. Okay? Cool. Any questions on that? Yeah? Why doesn't the satellite just like retain the relative velocity of the Earth like when you're like traveling on a bus and you're like flying and like why is it not? Why does it have to be not? Right, okay. So, if we were to, 
throw the satellite straight upwards, then it would have the relative velocity from the Earth, right? Like you say, that idea of being on a bus, you've got that relative velocity. But at that point, it wouldn't be enough velocity to keep our satellite in orbit, because remember, we need to be moving at seven kilometers per second to get us to stay and not fall down. So when we launch it, we have to add some velocity into it to keep us moving. And we just, we, we can't, uh, sorry, okay, let me retract. If you're in low Earth orbit, you need to be moving at about seven kilometers per second to be able to maintain that orbit and not fall back down, which means we have to be moving with a faster velocity than the Earth is rotating at. Where that is not true is if you move all the way out to the geostationary orbit, now you can move at the same velocity that the Earth is rotating at and not fall down. And so that's where we get this fixed view of the Earth, which we'll look at in a second. Does that make sense? So the change in longitude is because your satellite is going around the Earth and it's sort of, let's imagine it's fixed in space. It's not quite, but for all intents and purposes, we can imagine it's fixed in space, right? So if nothing else existed, your satellite would just move around in a perfect circle. So if the Earth wasn't rotating, you would continuously pass over the same points. So every time you came back to the equator, you would be over the same point. But low Earth orbits take about 90 minutes, give or take, 90 to 120 minutes. So by the time you've traveled 90 minutes, the Earth has rotated a little bit. So when you come back over that equator, you're seeing 90 minutes away from where you were when you started because the Earth has moved 90 minutes. Yeah. So although you've got some velocity following the direction of the Earth, you're actually, it's still moving underneath you, if that makes sense. Yeah. It's a bit tricky, but yeah. It is. This is one of the trickiest things, is to try and work out how your orbits translate to the ground. It is really tricky. And it doesn't help the fact that the way that we map things is rectangular, which is not a good reflection of how the real world works. Okay, so I want to talk really briefly about something called a sun-synchronous orbit. So a sun-synchronous orbit, and again, there's a question here to think about why these are advantageous and dis disadvantageous. Uh, so a sun-synchronous orbit is an orbit which basically always has the same orientation to the sun. Okay, so forget about our Earth for a minute. We don't care about that. It has the same orientation to the sun. So if we think about uh, this green line here as being our orbit, every t as our Earth moves around the sun, that green orbit always has the same angle towards the sun. It would be easier if it was at 90 degrees, right? But basically, that green orbit always has the same direction towards the sun. The red orbit has the same direction in inertial space, right? It doesn't rotate. So at this point, it's side onto the sun. At this point, it's face onto the sun. At this point, it's side onto the sun. So the green one is our sun synchronous orbit. And basically, yeah, it means that we always have the same orientation between our orbit plane and the sun. So have a think about why that might be valuable and pop in some answers. It's not to be excessively disruptive, but about orientation. So a sun-synchronous orbit is an orbit that is always in the same orientation relative to the sun? Correct. In terms of right ascension. R-A-N-E, right? Correct. So if we think about, in fact, let me do a little demo while you're putting in some, some answers. So if this was the sun, and I'm the orbit, and the satellite's going this way, right? So this is kind of my orbit plane. As I move around the sun, I'm turning, let me crack into the table, so that I'm always facing the sun. Yeah. So miss, in the, in the diagram, the green orbit is that of the satellite. The green orbit is an example of a sun-synchronous orbit. The red orbit is an example of a non-sun-synchronous orbit. And not disruptive at all. These are great questions to clarify, so thank you. Right, okay, I don't want to dwell too long on this one because it's a tricky one, um, but most of you have picked up the key points, which is that... It's great for solar power, right? So if we want to be constantly illuminated by the sun, we can orient ourselves so that we're always facing the sun and we never go into eclipse. 
So if we're always side on in this kind of scenario where this is the sun and this is my satellite, we will never go into eclipse because we'll never go behind the Earth. Um, so that can be a really, really handy thing for satellites that need a lot of power. The other, th uh, it's, called, uh, yeah, it's called riding the Terminator, which I just think is fun. Um, the other thing that's quite useful for this is that it means that when you pass over a point on the Earth, it will always be the same time of day. Yeah, so I think this is easier to think about if you picture it as a side-on orbit. So this is the sun now, and we're side-on. So for this side of the Earth, it's always noon, because it's pointing directly at the sun. So every time I pass over that point on the Earth, it's always noon. Yeah. So that means if you're taking images, they're always going to have the same lighting conditions, give or take. Uh, and it's a really popular orbit, so there's lots of launches available to sun-synchronous orbit, whether you like it or not. <laughs> Downsides, it passes overhead at the same time each day, so if you want to monitor how something changes at different times of day, you can't. So, for example, one uh, example I've heard is people wanting to monitor urban areas and look at car parking or traffic. You can't really do that very well using this orbit, because you're always seeing it at the same time of day, so you can't see how things change over a short time periods. You need precise orbit control to maintain this particular orbit, and it's very busy. So cheaper to get there because there's lots of launches, but it's quite busy. There's a lot of satellites there already. Uh, the trick with a sun-synchronous orbit is that it has to be a retrograde orbit. So if you look at what we're seeing on the image here, before our satellite was heading eastwards, now it's heading westwards. It has to be a retrograde orbit. It just doesn't work otherwise. Um, with, with, within the bounds of sensible physics, basically. Um, so they will always be retrograde, so we're heading off in a different direction. Um, but we're still getting this same change in longitude that we saw before. Wait, yes, so the change in longitude is also westerly for sun synchronouses? Uh, yes. The change in longitude is happening because of the rotation of the Earth. So that's not changing. Uh, I put a link in here to a nice video on YouTube that explains this quite well if people want to look into it a little bit more. Okay. Everyone happy with that? These are one of the most complicated orbits to try and understand, so take a bit of time. Right, medium Earth orbit. We're on to the next one. What are the advantages and disadvantages of a medium Earth orbit? So remember, this is higher than a low Earth orbit, lower than a geostationary orbit in that sort of weird cloud region that we saw in the first image. So again, just pop in some advantages and disadvantages. Feel free to have a chat with the people around you. I know I'm making you work really hard today. I do apologize. I'm fine. <laughs> Okay, some great answers coming in. No Starlink satellites, yeah, that's a good point. It's not, it's not nearly as crowded. <laughs> and if you don't like sharing a bus with Elon Musk, then yeah, absolutely. Uh, more, more fuel to get there, yeah, absolutely. Whether that's with your launch or whether you have to uh, maneuver there yourself. Less drag, great advantage. Um, worse resolution in your imaging, absolutely. Van Allen belts as a big disadvantage. You've got more radiation. Um, doo, doo, doo. It, it gives you a good compromise. Yeah, absolutely. It, it can be a really good balance depending on what you're trying to achieve. But you do have a delay in comms. I, think, I mean, I think you've pretty much covered everything here, which is excellent. So I don't need to labor this. Um, so yeah, you'll get a bigger field of view. I think that's the only one I haven't seen. Oh no, somebody said it, larger area for camera, excellent. So you'll get a larger field of view, you're kind of zoomed out, so you can see a larger area of the Earth. You've got those slower passes overhead, so you've got longer to communicate with your satellites, and you've got no drag to deal with. So those are some key advantages. Um, you pointed out some more as well. Disadvantages, Van Allen belt exposure. Obviously, it depends a little bit on what you pick as your orbit elements, but there's a good chance you might be exposed to the Van Allen belts at the very least on your way up. Uh, high launch energy to get there, and you need more power for your communications. Um, I mean, the, like I say, these are not exhaustive. Um, so again, I'll capture what you've put up here because there's some really great answers. Um, the satellites that we tend to get in medium Earth orbit are our navigation satellites, so GPS, Galileo, those kind of ones. Um, 
And they give you these really funny uh, orbit patterns, which I quite, uh, these ground tracks, which I quite like. So this is an example of a Galileo. So this is the European version of GPS. Um, and this is the kind of orbit that you get. So you get this weird kind of almost vertical pass. And depending on where you put them, they almost pass over the same point again when they come back on the downwards pass. So this is an upwards pass here. This is a downwards pass here. And you can see they're almost passing over the same point. Some of them are actually quite close together. Um, basically, the reason that they do this is it means that when they use multiples of them, which they do for, for GPS and Galileo, they can kind of space them out so that they get really good coverage across the whole Earth, um, which is really, really good. Um, so yeah, so they give you these fun orbits, which I think is quite cool. And they're quite distinctive. Do I have anything else on that? No, I don't. Um, any questions on that? Yes? Well, this one with the longitude, the shift is to the east. Yes, correct. So again, this is all to do with the difference in time between the time it takes the Earth to rotate versus the orbit period of the satellite. So when we're looking at this, for example, so although that medium Earth orbit kind of starts at 2,000 kilometers and runs up to 36,000 kilometers-ish, it's quite a big range, most MEO satellites are around 20,000 kilometers altitude. So this Galileo one is about 20,000 kilometers, give or take. The reason is because you get this nice, um, this nice effect where it's basically half of a geosynchronous orbit. So where it's coming up, at this point, it comes down very close to it again. So you're almost passing over the same point twice per orbit, which is why they pick that altitude. Um, and because it's 20,000, it's a much longer orbit period compared to your low Earth orbiting satellites. And that's where you get this change in direction. Excellent question. Thank you. Yes? Oh, yeah, great question. So sun synchronous orbit. Uh, I'll just pop back just so everyone's clear what we're talking about. Sun synchronous orbit, it, it, sun synchronous orbits, to make them work, you have to combine your inclination with your altitude very specifically. But what you're generally looking at is somewhere in the high 700s to low 800 kilometer altitudes and an inclination in the range of about 96 to 99 degrees, give or take. You can do it in other places, but that's generally what we use. Great question, thank you. Right, let's pop on to the next one. Geosynchronous orbit. So uh, it sounds like a lot of you know a lot about um, geosynchronous orbit anyway. Um, but again, just to remind people, and you can pop some advantages and disadvantages in. So to be clear, the main thing to be aware of is that there's two different types of geosynchronous orbit. We've got the general geosynchronous orbit, and then we have a very specific subset of that, which is the geostationary orbit, okay? So when we're talking about geosynchronous orbit, what we mean is exactly what we spoke about before, that the rate at which we are orbiting around the Earth is the same rate at which the Earth is rotating. So you can imagine that if I was to um, draw a straight line between myself and somebody's coffee cup, I'll use that instead. So if this is the Earth and this is the satellite, then as I rotate around the Earth, I'm always looking at the same point because the Earth is rotating at the same velocity that I'm rotating in my orbit. So I always see the same point on the Earth. It's a bit like you drew a, 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 instead of having a pencil, you've got like a fixed rod and you're clamped on, right? You're always attached to that same point. However, in a geosynchronous orbit, you can have, for example, an inclination. So you might not be directly above the equator. You might be up at an angle, which means that you're basically working in this blue region here. So you could be inclined, so you're still moving around the Earth at the same rate, but your orbit will be inclined, and so you'll be moving sort of up and down in your ground track, which we'll look at in a second. Okay, um, great. Couple, I'll give you a couple of minutes to pop in some, some ideas. Huge launch energy, yeah, absolutely. Very, very far away, so we need a huge launch energy. Um, to get up there or a delta V provided by our own satellite. Low image resolution, absolutely. So we have a lot of um, weather satellites out in the geo ring. 
Um, and if you look at the images from a weather satellite, you kind of see whole storms, right, looking across the, the region, you know, the, the sort of dimensions of a continent, um, which is great for weather forecasting, but not great if you want to be able to look at things on the ground, for example. Um, Solar radiation starts to play a role. Yeah, absolutely. So we don't have as much drag. We really don't have any drag to deal with, um, but we do have to account for things like solar radiation pressure, which you'll talk about in your attitude control class. But yeah, just to say there's other disturbances as well that you have to deal with. Less space for satellites. Yeah, so as we saw at the start, that ring is quite densely populated. And so actually to get a spot in the geo ring is quite difficult. You have to kind of be allocated basically like a 10 meter box and you have to stay within your 10 meter box. So it's very crowded, particularly over particular regions like for example, the US, uh, Europe and so on. They're fairly heavily populated. So it's quite tricky to get a spot. Um, Van Allen belts again that we might need to pass through. Okay, so again, I think you pretty much covered all of these advantages, very large field of view. Like I say, you're looking at on the order of continents that you can see. And if you're looking at communications, obviously, that's great because you can communicate with a very large region of the Earth. Very long passes. Um, so again, that communications element, we've got lots of time to talk to our satellite and we've no drag. Disadvantages, uh, no polar coverage. Now, with geosynchronous, as I say, you can be inclined, so you can start to get close to the poles. But it's quite uh, energy intensive to incline a very, very high altitude orbit, which we'll talk about next week. And so generally speaking, you don't really get um, geosynchronous satellites that can see the poles because for various reasons, it's just quite difficult to do. High launch energy, you said, high power required for communications. Um, and low imaging resolution. What I haven't mentioned there, actually, but I did want to say, is you also get this communications delay, which I said you might think is not a big deal. Um, but if you've ever watched the news, I'm going to assume people have seen the news, <laughs> um, quite often you'll have correspondence in different parts of the world. And you'll notice that delay that somebody in the studio asks them a question and then they're waiting like two, three seconds before they start talking. That is because most of those are done with a geosynchronous satellite. Um, and that's the time delay for the signal passing back and forth, right? So it's not a huge delay, but you do notice it in, in those scenarios. So it is noticeable depending on what you're trying to do. Okay, ground track. So for a geosynchronous orbit, we get something that looks like a figure of eight, right? And this is because we're not moving side to side on the orbit, right? So when we pass over the equator, we're always passing over the same point because we're rotating around the Earth at the same velocity that the Earth is rotating. But because we're inclined, we're moving sort of up and down as well, right, at the same time. And so what you'll get is something that looks a bit like this. You all look concerned. I'm just giving you a moment to let that sink in. <laughs> Okay, so you can see why they're really helpful orbits because you can choose actually this, for example, I really want to deal with the Americas, you would always stay over the Americas, right? So they're quite helpful. And because you've got that large field of view, you can probably see quite a wide band of longitude as you go up and down. Any questions on that? Yes. Exactly, and that's the next one that we're going to look at. Okay, so the last one, to be honest, I'm not going to make you do this because it's pretty much the same as the other one. Um, geostationary orbit, so this is where we have no inclination, and as your colleague just pointed out, that means that we are essentially a fixed point on the ground. Uh, pretty much the same um, advantages and disadvantages. The only extra disadvantage I've added is that um, it's a more crowded orbit. So if you're willing to incline, it's not going to be quite so controlled and quite so crowded. If you want to be in that fixed geo equatorial ring, it's going to be busy um, and it's quite hard to get a slot. Um, and it's infinite passes. So obviously when we're going up and down, it's possible that if you've got a ground station right at the top or the bottom of your eight, for example, up here, then you probably can't talk to your satellite while it's down the bottom. Um, but if you're talking about a geostationary orbit, then you're always going to be able to talk to it because it's just a single point and it never moves. Okay? All right, any questions on that? <laughs>
We're on to the last one next, so you're nearly there. Okay, let's get on to the last one, which somebody actually suggested right at the start of the class for observing the UK, which is a highly elliptical orbit. So highly elliptical orbits can be advan advantageous uh, for a lot of different reasons. But basically, a highly elliptical orbit is exactly what it sounds like. So rather than being a circular orbit, which is what most of the other orbits we've looked at have been, some of them might be a little bit elliptical, but generally speaking, all of those will be pretty much circular. This is quite significantly elliptical. So the advantages for this, or, or the, the, the reason for this, is that it means that you can pass very, very close to the Earth on one side and very, very far away from the Earth on the other side. And you can orient it um, a little bit more freely than you can with GEO, for example. So again, if you want to pop some advantages and disadvantages in there, that would be great. I swear this is the last one. No answers yet. Do you not know, or have you just given up? <laughs> hey, there's one. Yeah, okay. So some really interesting ones coming in, and I think, yeah, this is... Highly elliptical orbits are really good for specific purposes, but they can have advantages and disadvantages as well. So long orbital periods and long dwell times. So exactly that. As you move around your orbit, you're going to slow down at your apogee. So you're going to spend a long time passing over whatever is below your apogee, right? Um, but equally, as you go at your low perigee, you're going to be quite close to the Earth. So you kind of can get the advantages of both. The difficulty is it's quite hard to design a payload or a camera that can work really well close up and far away. So generally speaking, what you end up with is something that works at one point of the orbit and then is useless for a good chunk of the orbit. Um, a long break time between, yeah, exactly. So when you've got your satellite up and doing its job up here at Apogee, that's great, but then you've got a break while it zooms around the back of the Earth. And so you either need more than one satellite to keep, con you know, so that there's always something overhead, or else you have to wait for it to come back around. What else do we have here? Uh, you can use it to avoid eclipse. Um, you can avoid drag disturbances depending on where you place your perigee. You can keep it so that both bits are above your drag region, so that can be useful. But you're definitely, well, not definitely, but you're pretty much going to have Van Allen belt exposure if you're going to have a highly elliptical orbit. Um, if you've got multiple satellites moving around, then you're going to have to hand off between the satellites, whoopsie daisies. Um, and as I said, the distance varies, and that can make it really, really difficult to manage your satellite. Uh, the ground track looks like this, and I think this helps to explain a little bit more why this might be valuable. So for regions at the uh, at higher and lower latitudes, we said the geosynchronous uh, satellites are not great because we can't really incline them enough to get good um, imagery or good communications at higher latitudes. Um, it's part of the reason, I think it's better now, but it's certainly part of the reason why in Scotland you really struggle to get a good weather forecast because the weather satellites, their quality of imaging starts to drop off at around 55 degrees latitude because they just can't see it well enough from geostationary. So countries like Russia particularly take advantage of these orbits because they get this long dwell time um, over that particular region. And so it's a bit like giving them a geosynchronous satellite but in an inclined way, because um, it's much easier to incline these orbits than it is to incline a geo orbit. And so this is my very bad attempt at an animation that you're slowing down as you go over the top, and then you're speeding up as you go back towards the bottom. OK, that, as I say, is the last one. Any questions? Yes. Great question. So we'll cover this in detail next week. But basically, the reason that this one is easier to incline is that, what's the easiest way to explain this? So we talked about orbit energy, right? And the greater the semi-major axis of an orbit, the more energy it has, right? So this kind of orbit has a semi-major axis of about this kind of length. 
right? That's <laughs> very good. Um, but let's say this was 36,000 kilometers, right? Our semi-major axis is not half of 36,000, or sorry, our semi-major axis is not 36,000 kilometers. It's less than that because it's just half the length of the orbit and this side is much closer to the Earth. So our orbital energy is lower than a geostationary orbit because that has a larger semi-major axis. And essentially, when we want to try and change the inclination of an orbit or change its orbit plane, the more energy it has, the harder it is to tilt it. So essentially, the more energy in an orbit, you can think about it as the more angular momentum that it has, right? Because the satellite is spinning around. It's a bit like somebody spinning on an ice skating rink. So they have angular momentum. And the more angular momentum something has, the harder it is to kind of turn its axis like a spinning top, right? The faster it's moving, the harder it is to tip it over. So great question. We'll look at the nitty gritty of what that means next week, but that's ultimately the principle. Great question. Thank you. Anything else? Yes. Why would that mean you were more likely to crash? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it is flinging around and doing weird stuff. I guess it depends. On, so, yeah, I, I was just going to say, actually, I see what you mean by that. So I think it really depends on where you put your perigee, right? Um, and where you put your apogee as well. So if, for example, so your apogee is probably fine because generally speaking, these ones are going to be inclined out of the geo ring. You're not going to be going through the geo ring. Um, and your altitude just needs to be a little bit off 36,000 kilometers, say, and there's not going to be much there. We saw that kind of cloud in the Mio Pio region. There's not a huge amount there. It's your perigee you need to be careful about because, like you say, if you're in, say, a sun synchronous orbit, everyone's kind of moving in the same direction, so your relative velocities aren't necessarily as high. Um, whereas this one, for example, you could be zipping through sideways, so it's a bit like someone driving across a motorway, right? So, yes, um, absolutely. The, the interesting thing about this, which I always find funny and kind of hard to imagine, is that actually, when satellites are in orbit, they do all sorts of weird wibbly wobbly things. We study them and we pretend that they move in circles or nice ellipses. Really, they do strange wibbly wobbly things, um, which we don't need to worry about for most of what we're doing in terms of like orbit design and stuff. It's only when we start to come into operations that those things really matter. And we can control them in a lot of cases. What's really interesting is that the satellite altitude is actually fairly stable. So aside from drag, if you're in the dense drag region, your altitude will change. But aside from that, it, your, your altitude won't actually change that much. And we can, we can really easily, or at least we can very accurately predict how your altitude will change. So if you have two satellites in this exact same orbit, same inclination, same right ascension, for example, but their altitudes are different, they should never collide because those altitudes will remain reasonably constant over a very long period of time. So all that is to say, yes, if this happened to cut across at exactly the same altitude as, for example, a sun-synchronous orbit, then yes, it would be very, very hazardous. Um, but as long as we choose our perigee altitude carefully and make sure that it doesn't then zip through the middle at any point along the way, then we can avoid that happening. Great question. Making me think this morning. Okay, to finish up, next week we are going to be looking at orbit maneuvers. Um, this is kind of, well, it's the last section of orbit mechanics, and after that you're going to go on to your system design stuff, so that's the first thing. Um, it really is a chance for you to bring everything that you've learned together. It is the toughest part of the orbit mechanics section, um, but it's also, to me, the most interesting and the most in-depth. So, to make sure you can get the most out of next week, I would advise you before class on Monday to remind yourself about the apogee and the perigee, which is which, which are you moving faster at, and so on. Go back over how you calculate velocity in elliptical orbits, because that's going to be basically the bread and butter of everything that we do next week, is that velocity equation. Um, and it might be worth having a quick look at that patched conic slide that we talked about, about how we kind of move from one orbit to another. And if you're familiar with that, then next week is going to be a breeze. Okay? All right. That is it. Uh, and I will see you all on Monday. So thank you very, very much for your attention this morning. If you do the GMAT tomorrow, you finish a little bit early, you've got some free time. You can practice a lot of these orbits before.
examples? Yeah, for anyone who missed that, um, in the GMAT tomorrow, Ian said you can practice some of these orbits, have a look at the different orbit parameters and get to grips with them. So that's a really good idea. Thank you, Ian, for the offer. Hi. Yeah. I'm struggling to start imagining how. So, because it's inclined, it goes up and down on the ground. Yeah. So, I'm sort of confused with it in my head. Would it just be in, say, the geostationary at one point? If we're inclined, how are we going to just have a lack of line? Yeah, okay. Um, so it's, like a, yeah, good point. Uh, it's, probably hard to, it's, it's always hard. I should have brought my pumpkin, but anyway. If this is your Earth yeah. and your orbit is inclined, it's going to look something like this, right? Yeah. So, if you think about what we're looking at, go back, go back, go back. There we go. Right, so if you think about what's happening, on this side of the orbit, you're above the equator. So you have to be in the top half of the screen here, right? So you have to be on this bit. But when you come back down, you have to be below the equator. Otherwise, your orbit would be like a halo. It would be doing this around the top of the Earth, and that doesn't work. So it's just as it goes, so you're passing down over the equator. So forget about the fact that the Earth is rotating at all, right? And you would just be going like almost in a, so you're just going up, down, up, down every time you pass the equator, right? And then this weird wiggle back and forth that gives you the figure of eight is because it took me ages to figure this out with a coffee cup the other day, but it's basically to do with the relative velocity of the satellite and the Earth's rotation which changes because if you think about as you pass over the pole, yeah. your velocity is basically aligned with the, with the direction the Earth is rotating. But as you yeah. come back down, your velocity is kind of angled down and the Earth is rotating faster, which is why, so basically, as you go over the poles, you get ahead of it. And then as you come back down over the equator, the Earth catches up with you, which is why you get this weird squiggly effect. So if it wasn't rotating, you just start like a ring. Exactly. Oh, excellent, good, right, that made sense, <laughs> good. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hi, nice to meet you. <laughs> so, um, we have contacted Saria because I don't think we have any access to this. So, I'm preparing the. The head of the society is actually in your class. It's um, Josephine who was asking questions over in that quarter with the glasses and the long hair. Um, so basically, the reason I say it is they're doing a lot of rocketry and they also have money. So they have funding available, as in to buy things and to go on trips and all this kind of stuff. So they might, you know, you could kind of be part of that and get advantage of some more people to help out and support and also maybe um, some of the, the money as well. So, um, if you want, I can send you the email address for Josephine um, and, and put you in touch. Yeah. Physically, where your satellite is now, it's zero. Because basically, if you want to do things like that as part of the university, you kind of need to be part of a society so that you can be covered by health and safety, you can be safe. They have their own lab, so you could potentially work in there as well. So it would give you a lot of uh, support. And I don't think they would have a problem because they're already doing a lot of rocketry. Um, but yeah, I think I just said if you want me to put you in touch, let me know. I can't remember what I said in the email. <laughs> oh, because I just found the research. Ah, okay, yeah. So it's Josephine Riani. Just pop this away. No, no, I'm all good. No pumpkins today or anything. Roger, I'm going to go to the library. Um, yeah, if you give us a shout, you're free. And yeah. Tomorrow we'll finish with that and I'll be back up at the office. Perfect. Can you send us the information on this afternoon? Because I haven't been to any of that. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. Sessions. I will do, yeah. What time is it? Do you know? uh, one o'clock. One till two. No, well, I'm lecturing one till two, but then they've got group work from two till four. Yeah. So, uh, yep, that looks like her. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, if you're happy to, or like I say, I can send an email if you'd rather. Whatever works, I don't mind. I think I'm missing something. Oh no, I'm not. 
No, that's not mine. Thank you. I'm just having a moment. One last question. Well, it's in my bag. Yes. 